we understand the importance of positive thinking. However, what does Judaism say about how our positive thoughts actually affect the world at large? How does it affect reality? The secret, as we discussed earlier, holds by a concept called the law of attraction. The idea that thoughts influence reality. The secret, the secret talks about a universal intelligence that responds to our desires and our positive visualizations. If you really want something and you truly believe in it, posits the book, it'll happen. Now, first of all, whenever academia or the secular world says the universe or the universal intelligence, what they really mean is God. They can't say God because that's something for the theologians to discuss. But what they really mean, universal intelligence, the universe, is a sort of divine essence to reality as we know it, what we call God. In the God world, in the world where God is interacting with us and watching over us, I can't say that the Torah perspective agrees 100% with the law of attraction. Because any whims or cravings or desire that we have, God's just going to grant it to us or it's going to appear out of thin air? No. However, there are some fascinating parallels that we're going to explore. How does, how does my thoughts, how do our thoughts create reality, change the fiber of reality? It's very much related to an idea in Judaism on the idea of trust in God. Trust in God. Trust in Hebrew, and as it's talked about in the philosophical works, is called bitachon. Bitachon means trusting in God. Now, it's different from a concept that we know called emuna, which is faith in God. What's the difference between faith, emuna, and trust, bitachon? So many people think that, one, that bitoch and trust is just a more, intense, a more intense feeling of faith. One is faith, and one is really, really, really strong faith called trust. <laughs> bitoch is really, really strong emuna, in other words. It's a little bit different. To sum it up, emuna, faith, if we were going to encapsulate the entire idea, maybe to a sentence or two, it's the idea that we believe, we believe that everything is guided in the grand scheme of things. Whether I perceive something as good or that I perceive something as not good, I believe, I have emuna, I have faith that everything has a reason, although I may not see the good in it at the moment, everything has sort of a reason. This is something that obviously breeds serenity, because whatever happens is meant to be. It's a good idea. Whether I, again, whether what I perceive as good is actually good, or, or I perceive it as good, is one thing. But I have faith that everything happens for a reason. Trust is a little bit deeper. Trust says, I have absolute certainty. I have absolute certainty and conviction that God is going to make things good. And not only good in the grand scheme of things, but good in a way that I can relate to the good. We have it, we're presented, in other words, we're presented with a certain situation. Person goes through a challenge, uh, somebody you know, loses their job, for example, or is in a transition in life. A person with bitachon, with true bitachon, which is not easy to do. No one's saying that. But someone with true trust, true bitachon, says it has a certainty that I believe, I know that God is going to do good for me, and not only good in a way that is good in the grand scheme, but a good in a way that I can relate to. There's a wonderful biblical narrative that really demonstrates the dynamics of trust and how it works, and further, how our thoughts create the reality in which we live. Many people, many of us are probably familiar with 
Moses in Egypt. And Moses, one day he encounters an Egyptian beating on an Israelite. And what does the Torah tell us that Moses does when he encounters this? He kills the Egyptian. Following that occurrence, Moses then finds two Israelites, two Jews fighting. That happens? Two Jews fighting? He found two Jews fighting. And Moses goes over, hey guys, what's going on? You're trying to break it up. And so one of them says to him, what do they say? You're going to kill us like you killed the Egyptian? The Torah says something very shocking after that. It says like this, Moses became frightened. He said, indeed, the matter has become known. And right away afterwards, the Torah tells us, Pharaoh heard of the incident and sought to slay Moses. So Moses becomes frightened. The, 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 the account, the story had become known. And Pharaoh, then it says after that, Pharaoh heard of the incident and sought to slay Moses. Why does the Torah tell us about Moses' emotional response? Moses became frightened. It's not something typical in the Torah to talk to, talk to us about our forefathers' emotional um, issues or struggles that they're going through, how they felt. Abraham was happy then. Right? Isaac felt nice. <laughs> Moses was scared. But when the Torah goes out of its way to describe something, it's meant as a lesson. First of all, it's a normal reaction. Wouldn't you be scared? Wouldn't the normal person, wouldn't even a great person be scared? It's a normal reaction. Why does the Torah have to tell us that? We could, we could probably assume that he'd be scared. So everything in the Torah is meant, every word, every letter, and even every crown on every letter is meant as an eternal lesson for all Jews in all places at all times. Why, why does the Torah, what's the eternal lesson that we're being taught by the Torah telling us that Moses was scared and then subsequently being taught that Pharaoh heard? In order to get the answer, we're going to preface with a short idea. The idea is brought by the Rambam, the famed medieval sage Maimonides, in his magnum opus of philosophy, the Mor Nevuchim, the Guide for the Perplexed. He says as follows, the human mind is intimately cre uh, connected with the active intellect, the divine intellect. Divine, this is a divine attribute independent of the human being. Our thoughts are influenced by this active intellect and it also attracts energy from it. Meaning that there's a, a give and take in what happens in our mind and what happens in the world. The Rebbe, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, explains the juxtaposition of these verses in the Torah and tells us a tremendous lesson for our daily life. Again, the verses that are juxtaposed, Moses becomes frightened, and he says, indeed, the matter has become known. And then right away, Pharaoh heard of the incident and sought to slay Moses. The Rebbe says, these verses are juxtaposed and the Torah indicates Moses' fear for the following reason. Moses' fear, his negative outlook, his thought process, is what caused Pharaoh to hear. Meaning, because of the fact that he became scared, the world became a scary place. Because of the fact that that moment that there was a certain lacking in trust, a lacking in certainty, that things are going to be perfect, that things are going to be good in a way that I can see them as good, the world became a scary place. Because Moses was scared, because he was frightening, the world became a frightening place. Now the assurance that our thoughts and that God is going to do good things in a way that I can perceive them as good is not an easy task. We're filled all the time with doubts, rightfully so, we're human beings and we live in a world where things challenge the way that we think. 
But when a person does it, the thought actually becomes the conduit to draw down God's blessings. It, the thought itself, the perfect trust that we have, becomes the utensil, becomes the vehicle that allows God's bounty, God's blessing to reveal itself, to show itself in the world. So through us thinking positively, through us thinking and having trust that things are going to be good, the reality will come, and that is through the conduit of the thought. Even to the undeserving, even to somebody who, based on their actions or their day-to-day -day life, may not be worthy of God's bounty. Just the fact that they have the trust at that moment, with perfect certainty, creates the reality, creates the vehicle for that blessing to take place in the world. Litzemach Tzedek, the third Rebbe of Chabad, was approached by a person who had a severely ill child. And he told him a very beautiful phrase. He said, think good and it will be good. Tracht good, it's signed good. Think good, think positive, and it's going to be positive. Now the Tzemach Tzedek wasn't informing, giving him a pat on the back and saying, you know, think good, every, life's good. It wasn't wishful thinking. But he said, through your positive thoughts, it will influence that reality will actually be good. Anyone who's dabbled a little bit in quantum physics finds that we find a similar thing in the development of information, how, how the research is, is beginning to show itself. And that was something that was really brought out and publicized by The Secret. Nobel Prize winning physicist John Wheeler said the observer is essential in the universe to exist. The observer is essential for the universe to exist. Another Nobel laureate, Eugene Wigner, says that the conscious observer, specifically a person with free will, is necessary to act on quantum particles to bring them into a state of real existence. Meaning that existence doesn't exist until a free-willed being observes it and wills it into reality. Very similar to what we're talking about here. Just by the thought, just by thinking positively, thinking in the right term of things, it makes, it creates the reality that uh, is good, is desirable. Let's talk about a little bit the mechanics of how this works. You know, many of us, including myself and including Moses, aren't always 100% of the time able to have a perfect trust in God. It happens. But until that time comes, there is a, there are, there's an idea, some food for thought, how we can think, how our positive thoughts influence reality in a very practical way. When God created the world, he went from un, unbridled bounty, unbridled godliness, to a world that we find ourselves in today, to a realm that we find ourselves in today of, of constriction where godliness is not apparent. And this, this constriction or limitation, this veil, is very similar to what the physicists talk about when they talk about different dimensions of reality. How reality as we see it isn't the actual reality that exists. There's so much more to it than we're privy to. We have a very limited scope. The dimensions go as follows. The first dimension is one direction, length. Take for example. Okay, two dimensions is length and width. Right? Any photograph is, is an object that is the people on the photograph. The people on the photograph exist in the second dimension, just length and width, two-dimensional object. Just like a painting, same thing. If you want a, an example of a moving two-dimensional object, think of, you know, everyone remember from the 1980s, Mario, the first Mario that came out, little flat guy walking along. All he, all he can do is up, down, left, and right. For Mario, or Pong, do we have to bring it back a little bit a few more years back? Pong. The tennis game where it's this, like these two little uh, flapping things hitting that, that circle ball. Not a round ball, but a circle ball, two-dimensional ball back and forth with each other. 
So that's something existing in two dimension. Now to a two dimensional object, the idea of a third dimension of what we, third dimension is the reality that we currently live in, is length, width, and depth, or height, a three dimensional object. We live in a three dimensional world. We have, we can go this way, we can go all directions. We can go out. So for a two dimensional figure, for Mario, we'll call him, the, the idea of a third dimension, of going, being able to go to this way, that this is incorporate, this is part of reality, is completely beyond his realm of thought. So what's the fourth dimension? That's right. One is a measure of length, one is a measure of width, one is a measure of height, and the measure of change is time. Time is the fourth dimension. Meaning, and again, it's a concept that we can we can't really fathom because we live in the third dimension. But if a person could look at the world or look at another person in the fourth dimension, you would see them as they were a minute ago and a minute from now, all existing simultaneously at the same time. Whoa. Not only would you see them as they exist a minute from now and a minute ago at the same time, but you'd see them from womb to tomb from the time that they were born until the time that they die, all at the same moment. You see them all in one simultaneously existing moment. Now, if you think about this for too long, your head explodes. <laughs> but just the idea that, there is an, that there's a concept called the fourth dimension, time, where all time exists, where all what we call time, which is really a veil, exists simultaneously at once, and if you take it a step back, everything that happened from the beginning of creation that will happen until the end of time it will be seen simultaneously all at one point if we could view the world in the fourth dimension. Past, present, and future existing all at once. Wow. Interestingly enough, in Jewish texts, this idea is brought out to a forefront. Rabbi Eliyahu Eliezer Dessler in his famous work, Mikhtav Liyahu, says something very interesting. When a person is born, he's placed under the concealment of time. After his passing, the concealment of time is, will be removed, and he will view everything simultaneously, and he will see that time is merely a veil, since everything was really one reality appearing altogether. Whoa. What's interesting as well is Dr. Raymond Moody, his famous book, Life After Life, bestseller, who he interviewed and did studies, extensive studies, on people who had near-death experiences. Upon his research, upon speaking to them at length, what did they describe? What was the experience that they experienced in their near-death experience? Was a world that all time existed at the same time. All time existed at once in one simultaneous unit. So that's the fourth dimension. We're going somewhere with this. Don't, don't, uh, don't lose track yet. What would be the fifth dimension? We're, we're going to stop there at the fifth, after the fifth dimension because I don't know about you, but I'm, this is getting... What's, what would be the fifth dimension? So if the fourth dimension, time, is everything that happened from the beginning of time until the end of time all existing in one simultaneous point... The fifth dimension would be as follows. At every given moment, you have an option, and the world has an option. It doesn't have to be according to one timeline, or the way that things actually work out in the world of action. But at every moment, I could do like this, or I could do like this, or an infinite amount of other possibilities. So at every moment, there's an infinite amount of possibilities of things that can take place in the world. Every single moment that the timeline can go like this or like this or like this. Every single moment has infinite possibilities that can happen in that one moment. In the realm of action that we operate in, we can only have access to one timeline. In our thoughts, however, we have access to every potential at every moment. Meaning 
that when a person thinks positive about a certain scenario, he brings that potential future, that, possible, that possibility, one step closer to themselves. Through viewing the world in a positive perspective, again, at every moment you have an infinite amount of possibilities of what could happen in the world. Through thinking about the positive way, the way that you want it to, the way you would like to have it, you connect yourself more, you walk through that portal of existence, you walk through that portal of reality, you help bring it closer to tangibility in a way that you can experience. So thinking positive brings that potential closer to our real-world course of events.